I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell story because I know it is true it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story just a, a wonderful time here together and uh, it's good uh, seeing our church family together and uh, those of you that are online I know that some of you are are separated by a lot of miles and to try to say we'd love to see you in church every Sunday 
uh, we realize that, well, we would like to see you in church every Sunday, don't get me wrong, but we realize that the driving in from Alaska and Oregon and Illinois and Wisconsin and Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, uh, the list goes on and on, and I know I'm going to get in trouble by not mentioning a state or a place, uh, but, uh, but we, we would love to have you there. We do have folks that, uh, that are still local that uh, we would really encourage you to, to start making your way back into the fellowship again. Uh, with, uh, with COVID, things are changing a lot. Uh, it's not near the hazard and not near the threat that it was. Is it still out there? Yes, it is. But treatment options and things that can be done, uh, it's not something to, to be terrified over. And we have plenty of room here in the sanctuary. You can social distance. If you want to come in and wear a mask, you can. Uh, we, do not, uh, we do not want anyone to feel out of place. Uh, but we just invite you to come back and, and be a part of our in-person fellowship and, uh, and to help fill this place back up. You are the reason, all of us, all of the church is the reason that we continue to do what we do because we're still making a difference. We are making a difference even with those folks that are not here. We are making a difference. We're making a difference in the lives of the folks that, that show up here in the, in the sanctuary every Sunday. And we're definitely making a difference in the lives of people that are out there that were separated by, in some case, thousands of miles. So this small congregation and those of you that, uh, that go online and, and see the website, uh, we took the picture of our, of our church off of the website because we want you to think that this is a large cathedral. <laughs> it is not, and I'll tell you right now that this sanctuary is about 40 feet wide. Actually, the whole building is about 40 to 45 feet wide and about 65, 70 feet long. That's it. Uh, it is a chapel. It is a very beautiful little chapel, and it is a place that you could call home as your church family. It is a place to come and worship. It is a place to sense the presence of God. And, uh, and we love, we love our church. We love what we have here and we love our people. And we'd love to be able to make a difference in your life as well. So if you are not part of our online uh, congregation, you just happen to find this on the website, uh, just send us an email. All of the links are across the top. Uh, you'll see over here to my left, the people here in the sanctuary can't see it, but it says ogfmc.com. Go right there. Uh, you'll be able to have our, our telephone, our email address. I know, right? It's so funny when I say that to the folks here in the sanctuary because they're all looking. So I don't see anything. It's a big thing. It's, it's right about here. And if I step over here like this, those of you online, you'll find out that my, my jacket covers the black lettering. But I don't know if I could go like this and uh, we'll see how that turns out on the video it's always fun to play but uh but we would just invite you to be a part of our church group and uh and just everybody needs god folks everybody needs to have a relationship with god and we all need fellowship one with the other some of us are limited some of us are not those of us that can gather we can make a huge difference and we gather so that we can make a difference for those that can't. Does that make sense? Yes. That's just a, a very simple thing. So, so we invite you to be, be a part of that. And uh, also, if you sign up for our email address or with your email address, you'll get a daily devotional. And you'll get a personal Bible study once a week. You'll get our prayer requests. Uh, it, it just kind of plugs you in and gives you a lot of things that helps feed your soul. Okay? That makes sense? So now that I've, I've covered the commercial, um, I invite you to, uh, to re-engage now again with the fourth sermon in this series, Blessed, Broken, and Given. And this week, we are taking a look at given. Given. And I'm going to warn you before I start, uh, you know, this is, gonna, this is probably going to step on some toes. It stepped on mine, but you know, that's okay. Uh, sometimes we need to just kind of be jolted a little bit and to have our attention 
shocked somewhat and get us back to reality of who we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to be doing for the kingdom of God. We all have a responsibility, whether we want to admit it or not. So this series is all about seeing our lives as bread. As you remember, Jesus took bread and held it in his hands and he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. And he says that his life was also blessed, broken, and given for the life of the world. So over the past few weeks, we've talked about how difficult it is to imagine our ordinary common lives actually being blessed, being sacred, and being holy. We don't tend to think that our common lives are really anything. Uh, we don't have notoriety. Uh, we don't have a reputation out there in the world. We're not television celebrities. We're not movie actors, although it'd be really nice to make the money that they're making sometimes. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be able to have a $3 million check that I could pay tithe on. That'd fund us for a year or more. We explored how our sin and our suffering make it feel like our brokenness disqualifies us from having something to offer. You know, my life has just been wrecked. I've, I've wasted so much of my time, and now that I'm a child of God, I don't have anything to offer. I don't have anything to give. I'm broken, and, and, and God can't use something that's broken. But we found out that that is not true. When we surrender our story to Jesus, our brokenness becomes openness to God's grace, and it can speak into the lives of someone else that's having that same brokenness. Your brokenness is not uniquely yours. Do you hear me? Your brokenness is not your unique story. It may be brokenness as it pertains to your life, but I'll guarantee you there are thousands of people out there that are going through the same things that you're going through, that you're going through now, and they're looking for somebody to tell them how they can make it. And that's where given comes into play. So this word given, what? What if you feel like you don't have anything to give? Maybe you think that purpose is connected to value. If you are just an ordinary Christian, is there really anything to give from your life at all? You say, yeah, I, I'm barely getting by. I mean, I had to take an armed guard down with me just to buy gas the other day, right? You're thinking that. How many of you noticed the price of groceries? That's going up. You're saying, you know, I don't have anything that I can give. Get the money out of your head. Okay, for just a moment, when we're talking about being giving people, now, please don't stop giving. <laughs> you know, my, the, the board of administration here will, will hang me if I say, oh, just don't contribute. I'm not saying that. But this sermon has nothing to do with money nothing to do with money so if you think that you're ordinary and you don't have anything to give that's not true so first of all I want us to look at Luke chapter 24 verses 30 31 and 32 it's in the bulletin there in front of you for those of you online it's going to pop up on a screen in front of you and Luke 24 30 through 32 reads this way from the New Living Translation as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? God's word. Now this is the third blessed, broken, and given story just in Luke's gospel alone. The third time Jesus takes bread into his hands, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. This is a moment of mission. This is Jesus blessing bread to open the eyes of people who are disillusioned and downcast. You say, how in the world can that be? Well, let me tell you exactly why. Those individuals that Jesus walked up to on the road to Emmaus just witnessed Jesus' death on the cross. 
They knew that he died. It's been more than three days. What has happened? They're downtrodden. Jesus uses this moment to touch them. In a way, this is a story that really shows us that being blessed, broken, and given is for the sake of the world. Not just ourselves, and brace yourselves, not even just for the church. If this building did not exist, we still have a responsibility to the lost. Do you realize that? We still have a responsibility to share our faith with other people, with or without this building. Now, don't, don't fear. We don't have a for sale sign out front. But what does it mean to be given? First of all, Jesus teaches us that to be given is to be spent out for the love of Jesus. Before we talk about what it means to be given, there's a one-word question connected with being given. You ready? Here it is. It's a, it's a big word. Why? Why? Why do we allow our lives to be given for another? Well, the obvious answer is love. What do we love in order to become given? Now, the answer again seems obvious. The person you are serving, the one to whom you are given. If your life is to be given for your children, then it is the love for your children that leads you to that place. True or false? It's true. If your life is to be given in service of the poor, then it is the love for the poor that leads to that givenness. That again is true. If your life is to be given in service to those who are marginalized, then that moves you to involvement and advocacy as well. If your life, listen, if your life is to be given to those of our church family, then that moves you to engage, reconnect, and support with all of those folks out there that we're not seeing this morning. That's not a cruel statement. It's just truth. Because some of those people are out there thinking, I don't, nobody cares. That's what they're thinking. Nobody cares. Some are even saying, well, the pastor hasn't even come to see me during COVID. Hello? <laughs> I'm not going to be that risk. And on top of that, here's a real eye opener. This sounds real self-serving. And I'm going to be real blunt about this. And this is for everybody here and out there. It's not just my job. It's not up to the pastor to get out there and visit people that aren't here. It's not just the pastor's job to get on the phone and call people that aren't here. It's not just the pastor's job. And that goes for this church or any other church. It's not just the pastor's job. It is the job of the church. It is the job of God's people to reach out, engage, and draw back in. That's truth. I told you it was going to step on some toes. And I might even get some unsubscribed <laughs> after this is over. I pray not. Hear my heart when I tell you that. I've been at this church since 1996. I love this church. I love the people of this church. And this church could do so, so much more if everyone engaged and if everyone recognized their responsibility to be a minister of the gospel, not just the pastor. Now, all of those things that we do because of love, that's, that's an obvious answer. Love drives us to a lot. But it's incomplete. And it's insufficient. It's not just love. It's not enough to sustain us, to carry us through the dark nights and the lonely hours. It won't push us through the pain and the hurt that we've experienced from the very ones that we're trying to help. Right? Say, so, well, you know, 
What if they get upset if I invite them to church? What if they get upset if I try to engage with them about the email? What if, what if, what if? Okay, what if? What if you don't? Does that sound harsh? What if you don't? They could lose their soul because you weren't willing to take a risk and try. Just file that away for a moment and hear my heart. If you don't believe me, let's ask the Apostle Peter. Look at John 21, verses 15 through 18. John 21, verses 15 through 18, reads this way. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Now, after the resurrection, after everything that was going on, Peter returned to fishing. <laughs> he went back to fishing. Think about it. He ran to the tomb, saw that it was empty. He was most likely with the other disciples when Jesus appeared to them. He may have been there when Thomas placed his hands on Jesus' scars, and still he went back to his old livelihood. Maybe Peter's prior failures prevented his progress. Maybe Peter felt that he had lost everything that night when he denied knowing Jesus. Maybe Peter was too confused about what the resurrection really meant. Maybe whatever it meant, Peter was too covered in shame for it to matter at all. He might as well try to just live a quiet life, a smaller story, doing what he did best, and that was fishing. But John describes how Jesus found Peter and reenacted the scene of their first encounter. The first time Jesus saw Peter and called him to follow him. All those calls to Peter, throw your, throw your net on the other side of the boat, he said. And they did. And, Jesus, and Peter was convinced that Jesus was something special. It was John that recognized that it was Jesus when he yelled from the boat. It might have been John who recognized Jesus first, but who was it that responded immediately and radically? It was Peter. He jumped overboard, swam ashore. There has been much exploration of the nuances and the shifts in word choices between the Savior and the disciple. We're not going to go into all of that. But there's one thing in that passage that sticks out in plain sight. All of the questions, all of the dialogue between Jesus and Peter, do you know what the first and foremost question was? Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? That was the primary question. Do you love me? Not do you love the sheep? Do you love the food, meaning my teachings? Do you love yourself? Do you love purpose and mission? The question was simply, do you love me? If you love me, everything else will be placed in proper priority. In the other gospel accounts of Peter's first call, Jesus said to Peter, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Telling Peter, I will engage you with other people. There, we must consider the true sustainable focus 
Peter, I'll lift you from a life that's going nowhere. I'll sweep you up into the greatest story. I'll give you a role in the kingdom of God. I'll make you a participant, not just a recipient. That is, after all, what it means to be given, but also to be sustainable. It isn't the love of being given that leads to our givenness. It isn't the love of a purpose that sustains us. In the end, that was not enough to keep people keep. Peter faithful. The love of a calling will never keep you from falling. It isn't what you feel called to do. If Peter's first call was about a purpose, come, I'll make you fishers of men. If that was his purpose, then the second call that Jesus gave him was a renewal of destiny and identity. It was about a person. Not about what he could do. You don't want to answer that question. Peter, I'll make you fishers of men. Now the question is, do you love me? Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus above all else? That's the question for us this morning. You see, God teaches us that to be given is to live for the life of the world. On the way to Emmaus, these two disciples, if not among the twelve, then among the many, had their heads hung low and they hid their tears disappointed they were arguing and debating about the Messiah and at that moment Jesus himself arrived <laughs> in the midst of their questioning Jesus arrived on their journey Jesus joined the disappointed and the disillusioned in their journey. Notice that Jesus didn't show up along the side of the road and stop these men. He didn't say, come over here. He didn't say, come to me. He didn't say, follow me. No, all that was well and fine the first time. Not this time. Not this time. Not when faith had been shattered, when hopes had been badly broken. No, when we are too weak, too broken to come to Jesus, Jesus comes to us. He joins himself to our journey. <laughs> no other God does that. No other God joins our life. We need to listen and learn and then enter the places of pain in our communities. Just like Jesus coming alongside those disciples, we need to walk gently into the spaces where the de-churched and post-Christians have gone. We. <laughs> Did you catch that word? We. No one can do it alone. Not you not the pastor we to those we love remember the list that i mentioned earlier of all those things that we loved and why why we do what we do jesus pointed to himself as the culmination of god's saving story after asking these disciples what they were talking about and then acting ignorant about the events in jerusalem Jesus revealed himself to them. You see, we have to find a way. Here's our challenge. We have to find a way to tell the world its own story, to retell the, tor the story of Scripture in a more beautiful and Christ-centered way, the way Jesus did. Just tell the story. You don't have to have three points in a sermon. You don't need to memorize the four spiritual laws or the points of the Roman road. You don't need to learn all those different types of gospel presentations. Just tell people what Jesus has done in your life. And then listen. Shut up long enough. I realize it's a harsh word. <laughs> Be quiet when you share and listen and dialogue with them. You see, Jesus demonstrated a kind of radical hospitality. When he met in their home, he did something that a guest in biblical times would never do. He took on the position of servant. These men that he was walking with should have been the ones that served the bread, that broke the bread, 
that welcomed him into their home. What does Jesus do? <laughs> when they sat at the table, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it for them. You see, our society doesn't have that type of protocol. Yet here's this stranger in this home. They thought he was a stranger. And the moment he broke bread with them, they recognized who he was. Luke recorded this action in a deliberate way using the same set and sequence as the Passover. Every time. In an age when belief is contested, when religion is a private matter with little bearing on real life, the church needs to recover the art of radical hospitality. This is a kind of hospitality that is more than making our sacred spaces ready for others to come in. <laughs> it's a kind of hospitality that we exhibit by showing up in someone else's space going to where they are. We have to have radical hospitality. Thirdly, to be given is to continue the circle of grace. There's a kind of cycle to givenness. You see, giving begets more giving. The self-giving of God generates our own self-giving to others. It seems to be this way by God's design. Doesn't this make God's giving then kind of impure if he's only giving to get? No. Does a true gift need to be one with no expectation of return? In Western minds it seems silly at best, coercive at, at worst. Isn't it manipulative? Why do we give to get? Shouldn't you give with no strings attached? But this is failure to comprehend the way that reciprocity works. Reciprocity is not giving to get. It's a way to reinforce a relationship. In the Old Testament, love for one's neighbor was a way to demonstrate one's love for God. If God showered his blessings on your crop or livestock, giving you abundance, you demonstrated thanks to God by caring for those who had less. The care of the poor was a way to return God's blessings to him. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. This is why Jesus would say generations later, as you did it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. At the heart of the gospel is grace, which is a gift that promotes giving. God is gracious. He gives good gifts. And those who receive God's good gifts are to return them upward in praise and outward in service. We don't just tell God thank you for them. We demonstrate by giving those blessings, the blessings that God has poured out upon us, the blessings of, of good health and companionship and love. Reaching out to other people, that's what God does to us, that's what we should do for others. Grace follows the pattern of reciprocity common to gift giving in the ancient world, but with two key differences. First, God's grace is given to the unworthy. And second, God's grace is meant to generate reciprocity in the wider circle, benefiting even more of those who are outside. Giving of ourselves. So wrapping all of this up, the givenness of Jesus, the bread of life, makes our givenness as a church, the body of Christ, possible. That's what makes it possible. And so the church, that community formed by the givenness of Christ, comes to be a people who are given for one another and for the sake of the world. The generosity of God is meant to form a generous community. The great gift of God makes us a given people. And if you give yourself, if you give of yourself to other people, it's going to change people. Hoping isn't going to make it happen. So in view of God's mercy, I ask you three questions to wrap out this series and to close this sermon. Will you offer yourself to him today? Question number one. 
Question number two, will you let Jesus send you into the world as the Father sent him? Don't think Africa. Might be Africa, but don't think Africa. If your address is an the even number on the street, what about the people in the odd numbers? Cross the street. Will you ask him, third question, will you ask him to give you for the life of the world? What was it that Isaiah said in the temple when he was confronted with the presence of God? Who is going to go for us and who will send us? What did Isaiah say? Here am I, Lord. Send me. The call is the same. The message is the same. The gospel is unchanged. And God will use you to make a difference in somebody else's life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the faithfulness of your word and the fact, Lord, that this has been kind of an eye-opening time to recenter us, to cause us to think, to recognize our responsibility and our mission and our purpose. We're not in this world just to live out our lives and die and go to heaven. We're in this world to live out our lives, live it for Christ, die and say, take somebody to heaven with us. Help us, O oh God to be faithful in even the smallest of things. And I pray, I plead, that for every one of those small opportunities, for every one of those small things that were seized, for those small things that were done, help us to immediately see a result because it will give us strength and encouragement to try again. We need to see some wins, Lord, in our own life. We need to see some successes. So we ask you as we offer ourselves to be faithful, to be given. We ask, O oh God, that you would open our hearts, open our minds to see what is being given in return. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.